Hello, I'm Louise Chun, and I'm the founder of Welldoing, which is a therapist matching platform. And we wanted to celebrate 10 years of the matching platform, so we've launched the Welldoing Inspiration Awards. We want to recognize the people, businesses, brands that have set an example in the area of mental health and well-being in the time since we launched. So I want you to meet Viv Groskop, journalist, author, comedian, who has nominated restorative yoga teacher and author Paula Hines. So hello, Viv. Hello, Paula. Hi. Viv, Viv I wanted to start by asking what inspired you to nominate Paula for this award? Well, as soon as I knew these awards existed, the first person who came to my mind for a nomination was Paula Hines because she is one of these people in the well-being space who really lives the thing that she preaches. And I know that, you know, a lot of great practitioners in the well-being space do exactly that. But I just have always felt that Paula's example really stands out. We first met when I was doing a lot of stand-up comedy and she was working as a comedy writer and a comedy producer. Um, so we both met at a time when we were very stressed and perhaps our well-being and mental health was not in a good place. And then we just kind of kept in touch and Paula made this huge career pivot um, into restorative yoga. And we ended up getting back in touch. I ended up coming to her classes. Um, I'm an absolutely terrible yoga person. I know I need to do it regularly and I completely fail, but every time I'm in one of Paula's classes, I feel like that kind of measure of failure doesn't really matter. She makes all of that fall away. And I just have always really respected her as somebody who's incredibly inclusive, um, who really understands the pressures of life uh, because of her previous incarnation, and who brings a level of no judgment to everything that she does. And what about uh, your own experience of the connection between movement and body and mental health, Viv? Well, my own experience of it is that whenever you can make it happen, it's the key to everything. <laughs> and I don't think anybody fails to realise that. I think it's really being able to find teachers um, and inspiring people like Paula that help you get on track, because it's not so much deciding to do that or recognizing that that's a good thing we all know that um it's finding the time for it you know the same way that i think some people struggle to actually make space for counseling and therapy in their life because it's a huge commitment even to find you know one hour a week that you can devote to yourself for your mind is really hard um but making that connection that if you can do that for your body at the same time then you really are giving yourself the proper time to rest and it's this idea of resting the body as well as the mind um, that Paula really excels at explaining in her work. And then finally Viv I wanted to ask if there were any sort of qualities or actions of Paula's that you believe had the biggest impact on a wider audience. It's definitely the way she embodies inclusivity. She does this uh, in a very physical way. You know, she is someone who is very present in their presence on social media, who exhibits just this level of being totally non-judgmental all of the time, both in her classes and on social media. She also has a brilliant way of showing people lots of different ways to access this work. You know, we're all different. Some of us don't want to go to a face to face class. Um, some of us do need that um, interaction with other people. You know, some people are going to be able to access her downloads that are available online to access her social media channels, which are free. Um, other people are going to benefit from her face to face work. And she's also got a brilliant book called Rest and Calm that you can have on hand to remind you of some of her teachings. So she's just a really brilliant force for good. And one of those people who manages to do um, promotion of a great message without making it feel like another burden of, oh no, that's something else that I've forgotten to do. So it just has a very elegant way of doing all of this. Yeah. Thanks for that, Viv. Now, Paula, over to you. Congratulations on your award. Uh, so please, could you introduce yourself and give us a brief overview of You Can Yoga and your experiences in the wellbeing space? Yeah, of course. Thank you. And thank you so much, Viv, for um, those kind words as well. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I am Paula Hines, um, also known online as You Can Yoga. 
And I have been teaching yoga for, gosh, 13 years now. Um, but I think as Viv mentioned, I worked in TV before. So I actually been practicing yoga for, I worked out nearly 25 years. And my way into yoga was actually via the stress <laughs> of that and also um, and back pain. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of what started me off on my journey. And really, it was how yoga helped me that inspired me to go down the path of teaching. Mm -hmm. So my teaching focus nowadays, I think informed by my own experiences, is very much on the therapeutic aspects of yoga. So that's where the focus on restorative yoga comes in. It's particularly, I, I describe it for anyone who doesn't know what it, uh, restorative yoga is, is, it looks a little bit like adult nap time because you get out all of your pillows and blankets and things. You can see um, why I was into it now. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a really, it's, it's a really lovely way in um, that practically anyone can do it. It has been proven there's been lots of studies on it that has all of these wonderful benefits in terms of calming the nervous system and also if you're recovering from injury and so I thought it's one of it's one of the most kind of I, I guess accessible practices and even in my book Rest and Calm that Viv mentioned one of the really big things I wanted to share on it because well-being yoga practices particularly it can feel a little bit exclusive that you have to have very special things to be able to do it and that you have to have lots of time so I make a point um, in my book of using pillows cushions things you'll have to hand and things that you can do in five minutes so lots of different ways that you can slot these practices into your life um, and so over the years I've done lots of trainings in other things that relate to that so things like yoga therapy for anxiety um looking at yoga and contemplative, contemplative practice in relation to neuroscience so what I do is in something like a restorative session I will weave and in, in lots of different aspects of that into a session as well I mean, how did you uh, feel when you heard that you had been nominated for one of the Well Doing Inspiration Awards? Oh, I was absolutely gobsmacked. I actually had to read the message twice. Um, but yeah, completely thrilled um, and really humbled, actually. Um, I think because I, I, I really do love the work that I do. Um, and I think the... I think what I get out of it is very much seeing the the benefits that other people feel. And that's the big thing that keeps me going. So to hear that I was nominated for this, it was, um, yeah, I was so over the moon and so grateful. Do you consider mental health as one of the benefits of yoga practice for yourself and others? Oh, definitely. Um, I think, so for instance, one of the, in terms of, the accessibility of the practice like I'm involved with an, a community interest company called Mindwalk Yoga mm -hmm. um, and it's a not-for-profit studio and very much the focus of that is on the benefits of yoga for mental health mm -hmm. but all of the practitioners there are black women and the particular reason for that is that through um, research we found that there were lots of black women who felt that they didn't belong in wellness spaces. Mm -hmm. So it was a way of thinking, what can we do to actually try and reach people online who might not come into a studio? So offering practices like yoga therapy for anxiety, looking at practices that can be helpful for depression. So it's not to suggest for a second that yoga is a cure all, mm -hmm. but that's an example of where like that, that real, emphasis of yoga being helpful and beneficial for mental health and also because I found that very much for myself too. Did, did you uh, find that there were any ba barriers to you getting involved in in yoga and if so how, how have you overcome them? Um, I don't know if I would say so much barriers for me getting involved I think because I just started for me I really just started with classes at a local gym and this is so long ago that it was a point where yoga wasn't the big 
uh, industry that it's become now. So we were just all in a local gym in our baggy t-shirts and tracksuit bottoms. <laughs> um, but I think one thing I would say as a teacher that I found is a bit of a, I don't know if barrier is the right word, but I think if you Google the image of a yoga teacher, I, I don't look like that. <laughs> so um, I think that has been a bit of a challenge along the way. Mm. Um, but I think where it also has been helpful is that people will sometimes find me a bit more approachable mm. and um, feel a little bit more at ease um, mm. if I when I'm teaching. So I think it very much depends, but I would say that's that's probably been surprisingly, I think, well, surprising because I didn't think about it going into it, but that's actually been one of my main obstacles. Mm. Yes, I can see that. I mean, how do you maintain your own mental health and wellness while supporting others? I it, it sounds like a cliche, but it really is by practicing all of the things that I teach. Um, I, but the, the teacher I originally studied restorative yoga with is a lady called Judith Hanson Lassiter, and she's known as like the godmother of restorative yoga. But I always remember something she told me, um, which was that like yoga or restorative yoga it's magic but the magic only works if you do it and so <laughs> I I actually it but it's that but it's always the idea of it doesn't have to be all or nothing so if I have a particularly full period in my life my focus might actually be a little bit more on things like breathing practices and where can I find moments in the day just to take a step back um but if I'm say at home I will always like roll my yoga mat out or a blanket on the floor and just give myself five minutes. Mm. Something that is really wonderful thing to do that I, I do that I would advise anyone to do if they have time is just to lie down for 20 minutes. And I say it sort of feeds back into lots of the research that's been done on napping and the benefits of napping for 20 minutes. Yeah. There's a yoga pose called Shavasana and it is just lying down. Yeah. And you don't lie down on the floor or you can lie down on your bed. If you're worried about falling asleep, you can prop yourself up slightly. Um, but I do all those. Well, I, I really do do all of those things. And that is what really helps me with my mental health a lot. Yes, I have to say, um, having done over the years, many different types of yoga, one of the things that and there were other yoga people who put forward for these awards one of the things i personally really liked about your nomination is that it was kind of non-competitive and that it really highlighted the um the kind of relaxing um, meditative side of of yoga um but that could be because i've spent a week in bed with covid and i've been <laughs> I've been doing lots of, of um, body scan meditations and things like that, trying to just, you know, forget about all the things that I should have been doing instead. Um, but that, that was great. Now, I wanted just to finish it off for both of you. Um, do you think there are uh, things in terms of mental health and the wellness industry that could be, you know, improving in the next 10 years? Paula, do you want to have a look at that? It could be, well, I could say something that I really hope will improve, but in which I'm starting to see some changes with is just for, for these offerings and practices to be available to a wider range of people. But I actually do see that starting to happen, I think compared to like, say even five years ago. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that that actually continues to grow because I think particularly with what what's happened what we've been through over the last few years mm -hmm. I think there's an increasing need um and seeing firsthand and actually you mentioned COVID one of the big surprises for me has been the amount of people with long COVID mm. who've been in touch with me who I might I may not have met them but they've, they've accessed my practices online mm -hmm. or they've had my book and I found out that they've taken my book to their GP to show them what they've been doing and so it's it's that thing if if it's if it's my hope is that the changes that have begun to start with it widening out and being accessible to a wider range of people that that will continue mm. 
And what about you, Viv? Have you got, I know that, you know, you're, you're, for example, at the moment, you're absolutely flat out with your book, which just at the end of this, could you tell us a little bit about it? Because it is very interesting. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I want to echo what Paula said for a start, and I'd love to see in the next five to 10 years, uh, an end to this disconnect between the political messaging that we have around growing acceptance of mental health issues and the help that alternative therapies can bring to people, mm -hmm. availability of counselling, you know, a lot of these taboos have been broken, you know, comprehensively by organisations like Welldoing over the last 10, 20 years. But we're not really seeing the financial and true political impact of this just yet. Mm -hmm. And of course, as Paula said, you know, COVID has really put such a big burden on the NHS that some of these things have gone a bit on the back burner. And that's also complicating people's experience with long COVID. So I really hope someone or a group of people come along who can start to unpick some of these things and make it all make more sense instead of just being about headlines. Mm. Um, in my own work, you know, Paula's concepts of rest and just allowing yourself to power down in the way that you would in a therapy session, you know, make it just about you, even just be in silence holding your body still. They've been so valued, valuable to me in my working life. Um, as you mentioned, Louise, at the moment, I'm working, um, promoting this book called One Ukrainian Summer, which is a memoir about my experience in the former Soviet Union 30 years ago. And I've written it to give the author proceeds to International Pen, which is a freedom of speech organization. Um, and as a response to Ukraine fatigue, and I'm having some really interesting conversations with people who just feel so burdened by the news cycle. Yeah. You know, that they can't get any rest from that. There's yeah. no respite from all the causes that want to come to our attention. Mm. And I feel like it's a real moment of urgency for people to prioritize their mm. mental health, their mm. social media health, their physical health, mm. and rest in and of yeah. itself it sounds yeah. so simple. But yeah. as Paula says, if you can actually find the time for it, it is magic. Yeah. Well, thank you, Viv, um, for nominating Paula. And congratulations, Paula. It's been lovely talking to you. And if people want to follow you, you're on all the social media channels and you've got your book called Rest and Calm. Is that right? Yes, it's, it's Rest and Calm. Yes. Gentle Yoga and Mindful Practices to Nurture to and Restore Yourself is the full title. And I'm on socials, mostly Instagram, probably oh. at um, at you can yoga, and that's the letter U, a right. uh, uh, can and yoga all and one as all as one word. Okay, terrific, lovely. Thank you so much, uh, ladies, and um, see you again soon. Thank oh, you. Congratulations, Paula. Thank you. Thank you.